you see the passing of time. We crowds in St. Peter's Square are praying like mad for the Pope's life. Where moments refuse to die. This is a momentous hour in world history. This is the invasion of Hitler's Europe. And where victory lives on. Plenty of girls are being kissed by plenty of boys they don't know, and they do not care. You can love it, hate it, embrace it, or turn away. Lennon was shot to death late last night outside his apartment building. But it is a past we all share. Come on out here and give me a salute. Big baby salute. This is where yesterday has a home, where we wonder what it was like back then. Go forward, knights in safety. And not too long ago. His spirit must live on. It's where history has its place and where the past comes alive. The History Channel. This was the guy that controlled the fate of all those guys, the foot soldiers of the French army. His followers bowed to him as a god. His enemies mocked him as the little Corsican. And he had the audacity to crown himself not king, but emperor. You go, guy. <laughs> but everyone agreed, Napoleon made things happen. He turned the young men of Europe into pieces on a chessboard and came this close to world conquest. Stand up! Right ready! Right ready! The Napoleonic Wars lasted nearly 20 years, and everybody got into the act. From 1797 until 1814, Napoleon and his army marched from one end of Europe to another, always eager to pick a fight. And these boys weren't squaring off with spears, swords, or crossbows of days gone by. They were using firearms, high-powered muskets, which took the hand-to-hand -hand out of combat. At the center of the action was the diminutive Napoleon. What he lacked in stature, he more than made up for in attitude. Napoleon was a neighborhood bully, and Europe was his turf. However, it was his homeboys, the foot soldiers, who did his dirty work. Time and again, Napoleon's men attacked anyone whose country was ripe for plucking. Britain, Spain, Prussia, Russia. You get the idea. Finally, everybody else in Europe had had enough of this pesky little emperor and decided to gang up against him. Whether they battled for or against him, Infantry of the day came to be known as Napoleonic foot soldiers. No matter who they fought for, these men shared a lot in common. For one thing, they were all decked out in fashions reminiscent of the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper phase. For another, they were determined to make their brief, miserable lives as comfortable as possible. I'll have some of that bread, Corporal. Food, drink, and an escape from battle were always high on the list. These men faced life and death with a fatalism hard for us modern folk to fathom. This was a time when few lived past 40, when the adage, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die, was all too true. Life in general at this period of history was pretty brutal. People didn't survive very long. There were a lot of diseases and other things that took the life of people well before the age of 40. and so. There was a fatalism about anything that you did, and going into the army was just one more way to experience life before you inevitably died. Pretty depressing stuff, but then no one ever said that war was pretty. 
So how did Napoleon and his fellow leaders go about filling their ranks? Just where did these lambs to the slaughter come from? Well, in 1800, soldiering, with the exception of officers, was a decidedly dishonorable profession. In England, the infantry was so despised that the recruiters gladly plundered the depths of society, the slime at the bottom of the puddle. Generally, it was someone who was virtually in the street starving, had been forced into the army because uh, of being a criminal, or had been tricked into the army by a recruiting sergeant. Recruiters used all their wiles to attract potential customers, displaying the dashing uniforms, playing up the romance of service in the army. Hey boy, come here, come here. I'd like to talk to you about it. And I think ignorance was a prerequisite as well. Sergeants traveled the countryside imploring locals to escape their lives of poverty and despair. Hear ye, hear ye! Tired of your poor, pathetic life? Is your master too severe? How about your wife? Forget about them! This is your opportunity of a lifetime. A chance to see the world and get rich. Rich! Rich! Be all that you can be. Join the British Army today! not responsible for death, mutilation, or missing body parts. In the British Army, many outcasts found their first, last, and only home. The regiment became their family, officers, their parents. Tens of thousands of backward illiterates became the army that would topple Napoleon. The Brits took great pride in their newfound mission and their fancy duds. Typical British foot soldier cut a striking figure in his red service jacket and gray linen pants. His French counterpart was an equally dashing fellow, clad in a blue jacket with white trousers. Both carried flintlock muskets, imposing 17-inch bayonets and swords. And both believed full well that when heading off to kill or be killed, you should always look your best. French, in contrast to the British, hailed their leader's call. Napoleon's magnetic personality and his system of mandatory conscription kept the ranks filled. He would tweak men's ears, believe it or not, and this was considered a great compliment, and they would march proudly to their deaths. Soldier, statesman, and icon, Napoleon inspired equal parts fear and love. Ordinary French soldiers of line regiments would die shouting the words, Vive l'Empereur, long live the Emperor. They felt a great pride in being French, in being able to give their lives for, for greater France uh, and the Empire, but more particularly for the Emperor in person. Frenchmen fought for their Emperor and for themselves. For the first time in history, foot soldiers could rise through the ranks on merit. Bravery was rewarded, and sucking up was an art form. This was a career with real opportunity for advancement, if you could stay alive. It was said during the period of the empire that every drummer boy carried a marshal's baton in his knapsack. Actually, this was true uh, in at least one case. Marshal Victor had been a drummer boy during the revolution and rose to the rank of marshal. He wasn't one of the great marshals, but he nonetheless did it. And uh, it was great propaganda. From London to Moscow, ordinary recruits were soldiers for life. British enlistment was for 21 years. It was a regular sight to see wildly weeping women embracing their brave young men as they headed off into the unknown as new recruits. Now, the soldier boys loved all the feminine attention, which was a good thing since most of them would die without ever seeing their childhood sweethearts again. The Russians, being realists, celebrated the soon-to-be dear departed with a blowout wake. They would give him a party when he was ready to leave because his family and everybody around there knew that this guy is not coming back. They were never going to see him again. This was the equivalent of giving him like a funeral wake. A soldier's days were numbered, but they were also filled with adventures. Instead of passing a lifetime baling hay and shoveling horse manure, he 
could travel the continent guzzling wine in Rome or sipping hot cocoa in Moscow. Some of Napoleon's men even got to gaze up at the Egyptian pyramids. By joining the army, these men had cast off their old lives forever. Transformed as if by magic, soldiers across Europe shared a belief that the uniform they wore somehow made them special. Before they assaulted or murdered, they'd be thrown in jail. Now they could go berserk and be called heroes. C'est la vie. What did it take to fight for Napoleon? Well, you try marching from Paris to Moscow without roads. The French like to say, our emperor makes war not with our arms, but with our legs. And they had a point. These were boys who would have made the Energizer Bunny look like a lightweight. Never was the term foot soldier more accurate. At the height of his power, Napoleon's influence spread over more of Europe than either the Caesars or Charlemagne. He envisioned a unified continent under one man's leadership, his own, and the men carrying out his lofty dreams, his trusty foot soldiers. Napoleon was notorious for pushing his men to the breaking point and beyond. Forced marches of 20 miles a day were common. And in a crunch, armies might cover twice that distance and then be thrown into battle. They gave all they had and then dropped from utter exhaustion. These were big armies. If you stood still and watched one pass, you could be standing there three days. They passed through many exotic places, and the strangeness of the surroundings united them. Nobody wanted to be alone in a foreign land, and officers were not above using the old carrot and stick to motivate their marchers. One way to keep them going for the rapid march is if you don't have time to forage, there were usually some what they called iron rations they were carried in the knapsacks with the soldiers, and they normally weren't permitted to eat them until they were getting close to the enemy. Nothing, not the fear of death or the lure of a woman's touch, occupied the soldiers' minds more than food. There was never enough. And remember, these guys were French, the same folks who brought us filet mignon, duck a orange, creme brulee, and of course, the Napoleon. These poor souls weren't looking for fancy French cuisine. They were so hungry, they'd attack the ground with bayonets, searching for potatoes buried by local farmers, with visions of souffles dancing in their heads. Even in the best of times, rations were insufficient. In the worst of times, anything went. It's a pig. Pigs, chickens, wild boars, you name it. If they could catch it, they would eat it. Every farmer in Europe learned that the French soldier would steal from you. The British soldier, on the other hand, would buy from you. Eventually, this gave the Brits a big edge. Even French farmers hid foodstuffs from their fellow countrymen, saving them for paying customers. Poor Frenchman often had to fend for himself. Something we take for granted today is that every soldier gets a canteen, like this one that the British soldier would be issued. And most armies issued a canteen, but not in the French army. In the French army, you either got a captured canteen from somebody, or you may do. What this meant was that if you went out and bought wine, you kept the bottle, and you used that as your canteen on campaign. French and British alike made their long treks, accompanied by great clouds of women and children, known as camp followers. For every 100 men, six wives, chosen by lottery, were allowed to join the caravan. Married and therefore considered women of decent character, these lottery brides cooked, cleaned, sewed, and nursed for the entire regiment. After battles, the lucky ladies got to search through the corpses for their dead or dying husbands. Now my question is this, these women actually win the lottery or lose it? 
The war was extremely difficult on the women, equally with the men, because they could be killed, they could be injured, they often had no pay, they had to be supported by the men, and this meant that if a woman lost her husband while she was on campaign, she had to get married almost immediately. And it wasn't unusual for a woman to be married four or five times on a campaign because both the men wanted it and the women had to have it. And, as throughout history, hordes of less reputable women latched onto the armies. Although prostitution was officially discouraged, French regulations prohibited so-called daughters of joy, whoring was considered a soldier's privilege. It was one thing to ask a man to give his life without a moment's thought. It was quite another to expect him to forego feminine companionship. Cultures and societies back during this time were less puritanical than they are today. In other words, the idea of prostitutes and the men being able to use women while on campaign was not considered bad. In fact, it was even encouraged. They'd set up brothels sometimes just so that the men had access to this kind of activity. So last year, here to sell your wares. Only the best. Yet a third group of women also pursued the armies, so-called canteen girls. These folks were much more like sales clerk than prostitutes, peddling everything from old liquor to new clothes. Many showed remarkable courage, taking up guns or even cannons against the enemy. One plucky French girl risked her life for a general wounded behind British lines. So the canteen girl says, well, let's see if the British will shoot a woman. And she gets in her buggy and then starts driving between the lines and nobody took a shot at her. The British let her in. She got and tended to the French general and took him back. On campaign, both men and women fantasized about women disguising themselves as men to secretly join the ranks. The men, of course, stirred at the prospect of a mysterious lass lurking close by, and women loved the idea of experiencing the passion of battle and the thrill of living amid hundreds of men. Or maybe they just grew tired of cooking and cleaning. It all sounds very romantic, of course, but what you have to remember is that these women uh, could pass inspection looking like a man. So, uh, you know, this is perhaps not quite as glamorous as first appears. The reality of being a foot soldier was often something less than what the press agents would have you believe. No surprise there. Perhaps the only thing the soldiers and their women could count on was hard-fought material gain. Call it plunder, call it the spoils of war. A few delights matched robbing your enemies after besting them in battle. Pretty spiffy, huh? Only the Imperial Guard, the Emperor's favored few, got to wear this uniform. To join this exclusive club, you had to be one, brave, and two, tall enough to cut an impressive figure. Now, let's take a look at this more closely. Napoleon was about five feet, five inches tall. The Imperial Guards had to be one meter 90. That's just under six feet. Now, what's going on here? Perhaps this is what's meant by the Napoleon complex. Smart commanders knew that men fought better if they were clothed, fed, and inspired. Simple rewards, a medal of commendation, the chance to wear an especially flashy uniform kept morale high. Love and adoration from the masses wasn't bad either. Victorious armies strutted their stuff down the city streets like Tony in Saturday Night Fever. War, losers are bums. Winners are heroes. The French, especially, basked in the reflected glow of Napoleon's glory. Foot soldiers, formerly the riffraff of society, rose to the exalted status of pop icons. Being a soldier in Napoleonic France was the equivalent today of being a rock musician or a movie star. The people who were lauded, the people who were most admired uh, by the population in general and certainly by the women, were the soldiers. Attracting women was why many men signed up in the first place. 
The gentler sex went wild for those snazzy uniforms and the courageous boys inside them. At home and abroad, soldiers confronted the advances of amorous admirers. One young man, a rifleman named John Harris, fell for a very handsome, dark-eyed Spanish girl while on campaign in Lisbon. She beseeched him to desert his colors to marry her. She tried very hard, and her charms were very tempting, but ultimately, uh, Rifleman Harris had to say no and stuck with his unit. But it shows the kind of way that the men could uh, be attracted to women, maybe even fall in love with them, which he admitted he did. But uh, there was another girl in the next town. Rifleman Harris described his final farewell with his Spanish senorita. As our bugle struck up, she waved her handkerchief. I returned the salute, and in half an hour, I had forgotten all about her. So much for a soldier's love. <laughs> Being a soldier also meant sharing common bonds with other soldiers across Europe, such as heavy drinking. In 1807, French and Russian troops went arm in arm to the signing of a peace treaty, and then arm in arm drank themselves silly until dawn. <laughs> Most of the Napoleonic Wars, they recognized the other guy not as a hated enemy, but a fellow professional doing his job. When the men weren't actually fighting a battle, they saw little point to shoot at each other. Soldiers on both sides would often establish a live and let live approach to combat. There was a case where the Duke of Wellington himself was coming up close to the lines, and someone from the French side took a shot at the Duke of Wellington. The French sergeant ran up to the Frenchman who'd fired at the Duke of Wellington and started beating him up, and then called back uh, to Wellington, I'm sorry, monsieur, he said, he's a new one, he doesn't know the rules around here. The rules also applied to building and maintaining morale. Music often served that purpose. On the march and in combat, Patriotic tunes boosted spirits, inspiring men to give their all. In one battle, Napoleon applied the principle of overwhelming force of musicians. They had assembled a mass group of bands from all the different regiments, 200 bands that gathered together that were going to play as the guard went into the last attack against the, the tired, exhausted Prussians who were just on the ropes. And as the advance started, these 200 bands began to play, and, and the effect on the French was so tremendous that it just helped them surge through and break the Prussian line and win the battle. Like an advertising wizard on Madison Avenue, Napoleon told his men what they wanted and then gave it to them. He began the practice of awarding common soldiers medals for bravery, lots of medals. He staged seemingly impromptu ceremonies, taking a ribbon off his own chest to pin it on a courageous soul, anointing him Baron of the Empire. column moved on, a new brigade was treated to a repeat of the spontaneous gesture, until by day's end, dozens of medals had passed hands. When an officer commented that the medals were merely baubles, Napoleon replied, it is through such baubles that men are led. He pushed every button, from a childish desire for recognition to a mature yearning for honor. During one battle, he chastened a beaten regiment for leaving behind the body of their dead colonel. And Napoleon said to them, uh, do you realize that you've dishonored yourselves by doing that? That a good regiment is always around their colonel, whether he is alive or dead. And the soldiers said, you're right. We're dishonored. We're going to recapture the body of our colonel. Vive l'Empereur. Off they go. They charge in, and they take the town. Napoleon is watching this, and then he turns to his chief of staff, Marshal Berthier, and he says, you know, I really didn't care about the body of the colonel, but what I really wanted to do was retake that town. Inspired by their leader, gullible Frenchmen figured it was a win-win kind of situation. 
Either they achieved a thrilling victory... ...or died a heroic death. Right one in the guts, all right, coming in there. When all else failed, Napoleon and his rivals played the greed card, enticing their men with the prospect of attaining wealth beyond their wildest dreams. Wanton theft and destruction were sure to brighten any soldier's day. Looting and pillaging after a battle, or even when there was no battle and you were in enemy territory, was officially frowned upon most of the time. But depending on the circumstances, some of the officers might look the other way simply because it was an outlet for the men. It wasn't pretty, it wasn't nice, but if they'd been in combat, if they'd been under hardship, if they're hungry, if they're really still angry, this was the best way they could uh, let them blow off steam was to uh, maybe even destroy the town that they had just captured. As they had for centuries, the soldiers delighted in pillaging. They were worse than rock stars in a hotel room. But the Napoleonic foot soldier truly lived for battle. Men would straggle along on empty stomachs, tears in their eyes from hardships of the march, without even shoes on their bleeding feet. Yet, those same men would rouse themselves when word arrived that the enemy was at hand. These men were professionals who, despite the protests of their bruised and battered bodies, knew they had a job to do. These old muskets could be downright dangerous for their owners. They had a nasty kickback that discouraged guys from sighting too closely. But it didn't really matter where they aimed. These things couldn't hit the broadside of a brothel or, a, or even a barn. Shots hit the ground or a treetop more often than enemy soldiers. Foot soldiers approached battle with mixed feelings. They yearned for the thrill of their lives, lives that unfortunately might end at any moment. Many felt heightened senses, aware that every experience, the warmth of the sun, the beauty of the landscape, could be their last. The key to a foot soldier's survival lay in his weapon. The British favored their Brown Bess musket, while the French carried their Charleville musket. These flintlock muskets were not only inaccurate, but painfully slow to load. The flintlock was over 150 years old by 1800, and a soldier still had to pour powder and a lead ball down the barrel before he could aim and fire. Remember, was happening while the enemy was charging at you. There was no magazine to slap into place. These bad boys fired at a rate of once every 20 seconds at best. Living in an age when death was a constant companion, men acquired a highly developed sense of fatalism. A good thing for a soldier to have. Fatalism reduces fear. Fear loses battles. People during the 18th century and certainly the beginning of the 19th century were very, very conscious of their own mortality. And during the Napoleonic Wars in particular, every soldier lived with the certain knowledge that he was going to die and the high probability that he was going to die very soon. Military tacticians of the day devised complex battlefield maneuvers, in part to distract men's minds from what lay ahead. Officers sang out orders, triggering thousands to move in lockstep heading towards almost certain death. Boy, and you thought your job was rough. A distant cloud of dust was usually the first sign of the enemy and the beginning of an elaborate game of chicken. Long formations marched towards each other. 
uniforms pressed and polished, bayonets glittering in the sun. The more imposing your guys looked, the greater the chance of intimidating the enemy. And then, all at once, they reached firing range. The weapon is brought to the present, which of course for a musket is towards the enemy. To full cock, and bang. We then have, as you probably saw, some sparks that are struck by the flint on the frizzen. These sparks fall into the pan, it ignites the powder, that powder explodes in the barrel, and a lead ball weighing one ounce flies down the field. More precisely, thousands of lead balls flew down the field. Thanks to imprecise weapons and nervous men, most shots were wildly, even comically, inaccurate. Only about one in a thousand struck human flesh whose flesh is a matter of random bad luck. Because the muskets would often foul or not fire, you'd have men not able to use their muskets properly, and they wouldn't even know it because of the noise and the confusion. Occasionally, they would become so confused that they would actually shoot from the rear rank somebody in the front rank. Although, someone did speculate once that a very unpopular sergeant might have to watch his back in a line because it might not have been an accident. After just a few rounds, the muskets became too hot to handle, forcing the men to improvise. There were some unusual measures taken under battlefield conditions when this happened, and there's at least one known case of French troops at, during the Battle of Marengo uh, urinating down their barrels to cool them off. That technique also ensured that no one asked to borrow your gun. To avoid enemy fire, men took to a sliding their heads beneath their shoulders, a practice described by a newly coined word, ducking. Even amid the confusion and fear, foot soldiers stuck together as one fighting machine. They knew that their best hope for survival lay in playing follow the leader. You would fire as per orders. You would not think about it. You would do it as an automaton. You would have drilled and drilled and drilled. Because one thing you couldn't do was be a, a lone wolf in a Napoleonic battle. The standard strategy called for softening up an enemy with bullets and cannonballs and then making a decisive charge. Attackers advanced shoulder to shoulder, just 22 inches allotted for each man in the line. Horses, with more common sense than men, refused to ride into tight lines of bayonets. One army charged, the other waited, motionless. In this mind game, the psychological edge went first to the attackers. But if the defenders held their ground and withheld their fire, the psychological advantage turned to them. The British Army was renowned for its coolness in the face of a charge. Up and down the line, officers restrained their men with commands of steady lads, steady, show no hurry. By holding their bullets and their emotions in check, the British intimidated their foes. At the last possible instant, they gave three cheers for the king and fired a devastating blast right in their faces. The enemy in disarray, British troops lowered bayonets and commenced their charge. We tend to confuse bayonet fighting with the bayonet charge. The bayonet is a psychological weapon. It's not a weapon that achieves its goal through actual use. One of the scariest, most horrific experiences a soldier could endure was during the last moments, the last few seconds of an enemy bayonet charge. In that situation, the defenders would invariably break. The Hollywood cliche of bayonets clashing is a fiction. 
Bayonet wounds were rare, and seen only in the backs of fleeing soldiers. As for the wounded, probably no movie has ever shown just how gruesome things could get. One of the few ways they had to treat wounds was through amputation. They knew about infection, they didn't know how to stop it, and so therefore they would amputate a limb. And because they didn't have anesthetics or a way to numb the area, they would saw it off with the man awakened and being held down by his comrades or orderlies. And the, the limbs would just pile up by the tables. And this sort of thing went on in, in field hospitals almost after every battle. It was a horrible, horrible situation. Those who fell in battle generally surrendered their dignity along with their lives. Not only other camp followers, but all the poor people, et cetera, in the area would come over and literally strip the dead bodies of everything. They take the clothes, the works. Surrounded by violent death, the soldiers took pleasure in gallows humor. Even at the bloodiest of times, perhaps especially at the bloodiest of times, they grabbed any chance for laughter. Right at the end of a battle, when the field is strewn with dead and wounded and, and men groaning and screaming, a British officer rode by this one line of men yelling, a guinea for my wig. He had apparently lost his wig, and he wanted them to go looking for it for him. And of course, the men found this enormously amusing and started repeating it up and down the line. And here they are in the middle of this carnage with something that you would think would be appalling, but they found it very humorous. By 1812, Roughly a million men had died for Napoleon. His veterans had experienced 15 years of the thrills and terrors of their unique profession. But nothing could prepare them for the determination of the Russian soldier or the cruelty of the Russian winter. In war, as in most things, success breeds success. For years, Napoleon's armies triumphantly expanded his empire. His carefully cultivated image of invincibility had created its own reality. Wellington once said that the presence of Napoleon on the battlefield was worth 30,000 men, and I don't think he was exaggerating. The French got a tremendous morale boost out of knowing that the emperor was with them and directing them because they knew he was a winner. Having Napoleon at the helm was sort of like having Michael Jordan in your backcourt. You knew you'd always come out on top. But like celebrities before and since, Napoleon let his own press releases go to his head he began to believe that he couldn't lose. When he invaded Spain in 1808, he triggered an all-out people's war to defend their homeland. The old rules of warfare no longer apply. The French were viewed as not only invaders, but representatives of the Antichrist. And it became the duty of every peasant, every woman, every child to oppose the French. You really couldn't be billeted on the local population because they'd slit your throats. Uh, you had to be on guard all the time. It got so bad that French soldiers had to forego the local senoritas. Too many were driving knives into their ribs. Every few minutes, a Frenchman died somewhere in Spain, and not of natural causes. Frantic for a way out, French soldiers began shooting themselves to escape further service. The French have always been wedded to the idea of la gloire, as they call it, the, the idea of, of glory in battle. Napoleon himself described the French army as being more than men in victory. Uh, he also said they are worse than women in defeat, uh, which basically means that, that if they see everything going wrong, then it will fall apart. At times, the French deserted en masse as they would famously later at Waterloo. But in 1812, Napoleon still commanded the personal loyalty of the vast majority of his troops. When he said go invade Russia, they jumped. The problem was, he hadn't reckoned with the zeal of Cossacks fighting in defense of Mother Russia. The French army soon learned the truth of the saying, it is easier to kill six Russians than to conquer one. 
the Russians would be lying down pretending they were dead and a unit would pass through them and then the Russians would, would jump up and shoot the French in the back. So consequently, during battles, uh, the French learned about this and they learned that um, don't leave any live Russians in your rear. The French instituted a policy of no prisoners, a tidy euphemism for bayoneting to death hundreds of Russian prisoners. Undaunted, the Russians made any and every sacrifice in order to gain a tactical edge. When forced to retreat, they reduced the countryside to an ash heap, burning crops, grain, dwellings, anything that might aid the French. Whole villages were set aflame. Finally, they shocked the world by destroying their own largest city rather than have it fall to Napoleon. The burning of Moscow really ushered in a new type of warfare. This is the first time that the people who controlled the town, it was their territory, decided to evacuate the people and destroy it so it could not be used by the enemy and therefore deny him an important base for supplies and for shelter. It was a 20th century idea ahead of its time, total war. If supplies denied them, the French found themselves deep in Russia in the dead of winter with nothing to eat. Napoleon finally ordered a retreat and escaped, but it was too late for his army. They were starving and freezing to death. When people had got really cold during the day and then got warmed at a fire at night, they tended to die. It was as if, if you could keep your body temperature constant rather than it going really low and then going up and then going low again, you, you could survive. French soldiers, proud heirs to the finest cuisine on earth, begged for food you wouldn't find in any respectable French restaurant, pieces of raw horse flesh. They would rip into freshly killed horses all raw, not even cooked. Other times to try to survive, they, uh, they'd also go to the horses and cut the veins of the horses and drink the blood, sucking it right out of the horse. I mean, this is how bad it got. 140,000 men began the retreat from Moscow. Just 25,000 escaped with their lives. Napoleon Bonaparte, master strategist, had bungled the job, and his foot soldiers had paid the price. The retreat from Moscow broke the spirit of the French army. But not until three years later, at Waterloo in 1815, would Napoleon suffer his final defeat, crushed by the English. For the common soldier of the British army, Waterloo capped an astonishing transformation. They had started as the dregs of society, unknown and unwanted. They ended as honored warriors. People could be forgiven of almost anything if they had fought at Waterloo. Sometimes ex-soldiers would get into trouble, but if they could show a Waterloo medal, they could usually be very, very leniently treated. In fact, there was a little doggerel poem in England at the time that went, have you been at Waterloo? I have been at Waterloo. Tis no matter what you do, if you've been at Waterloo. <laughs> Survivors recalled their soldiering days as highlights. Those who perished wished fervently that they would be remembered. Whatever his fate, the foot soldier achieved a kind of immortality. A song of the period says it well. Of wine, women, and powder, he never was afraid. Storm the trenches, court the wenches, love the rattle of a battle. Dies with glory, lives in story.